kindly share. And even if you are already a lapid, uh, kindly share with us if you are already in lapid or you've just heard of lapid or you're an aspiring lapid, uh, kindly, kindly let us know. And if you're new to lapid and you do not know what lapid is or what this program is, then you can let us know too. If you've joined in other webinars, let us know. Give us as many details about yourself as you can. So uh, other than encouraging the conversation, I'd like us to also encourage each our friends join in. If you know somebody who is interested, would be interested in entrepreneurship, then let them know. Uh, moving along, so I'd like one to welcome our, our host for the day. I, did I mention what my name is? Sorry, my name is Leslie. <laughs> my name is Leslie. I am also Lapida. Uh, I joined Lapid in 20, I had mentioned when I was on mute. Uh, I joined Lapid in 2021 and I've been with Lapid since 2021, then 2022. I'm still taking the pillar. In Lapid, usually we have three pillars. Uh, we have a lead self pillar, which is what you take uh, as soon as you join. Then we have a lead market pillar and a lead Africa pillar. So I've gone through lead Africa and lead self. I'm now taking the lead market. Uh, so just one more pillar to go and I'll be done. So, and the other thing about Lapid, I'd like to highlight some of the things that I've learned from the program. Uh, oh, wow. Every time I think about Lapid, it's just one of those things that I am so grateful to have joined. I'm like, Leslie, thank you so much for doing this for us. Because every time I think Lapid, it's, it's a space that I needed. It's, it's a program that I didn't know that I needed, I needed until I joined. Actually, initially when I was joining, I was just joining to get more friends because I felt that I didn't have life outside of work. It was just work, then I'd go home. I didn't even have any life like over the weekends. And I had a friend who was already in Lapid and I'd see them over the weekends. Maybe they have a hangout or they had a trip somewhere. And I felt that they were doing something with their lives, like they were doing something constructive other than going for shares and everything. So I decided to join. It's until I joined that I realized I needed this so much because I was at a place where I didn't have a sense of direction for my for my career. And even as a person, like I mentioned, when you join in, it's the self pillar. So that you're taught more about yourself. You're defining who you are and what you want. And also there's a lot of reflection. So they're not telling you what to do. They're just asking you the like important questions of who you are and maybe why why you want to do this and why this career and things like that. So I, I look back and I'm so grateful that I enrolled into Lapid and it's, it's been such a beautiful journey. So uh, I would like to encourage you, anybody, I was talking to, to Rispa, who was the host for the, for the other webinars. She'd been the host for a lot of webinars and she was mentioning that the, the application for the April cohort ends tomorrow. So that is quite fortunate and unfortunate at the same time because you still have time between now and tomorrow to apply. We just mentioned on the chat, in the chat box that you'd like, you're interested in joining Lapid and then somebody will get to you and they'll share with you the details that you need to give them and the information, any information or questions that you need clarified, they're going to share with you. So uh, moving along into the conversation, I'd like to introduce the, the guest for the day. This is a lady that I greatly, greatly admire. She's one of the main faces that you'll see when you join Lapid. And I'm so glad to have met this lady because she's taught me so much. I have learned so much. She has a very long bio, as you'll quickly realize, but she is so much more than her bio. And uh, her name is Esther Moniki. She's the founder and CEO of Lapid Leaders Africa. So, and Esther Moniki is an accountant. I'm an accountant as well, but... Uh, I'm no match for her, and I'll tell you why shortly. Esther has worked with the international audit firm PwC for other, over eight years. Why we, don't you all want to work with PwC as accountant? Is if you're an accountant, you know what I mean, or you're an auditor. And she's not just been in Kenya; she's worked with them in the UK. She's also an entrepreneur with more than ten years' experience in building businesses. Es Esther is also a corporate and SME consultant. Uh, who works with businesses and helps them to strategically grow their businesses. Her experience as an entrepreneur is now recognized as a national, at a national level. She was recently a judge in the Women in Business show by National, national Bank, which is also known, or you might have heard it as you've got business. Uh, Esther is all that and so much more. I've not done any justice to her. But then I have gotten to know her over the two. I've mentioned that I've been with Lapid for 2020, since end of 2021, all of 2022, and now. 
uh, what I greatly admire about Esther is the, pas the person she is. She's very passionate about people and about growing people and systems and organizations. But the person, she she's so much, but when you approach her, she's also so down to earth. You never know that she has all this power and she's so much more in a person when you approach her because she treats everybody and every situation like with the uh, importance that it deserves. And also the times you'll find like if somebody is like a high person, they will not bother with like small, small things, but that is not, that is not Esther. And she, she's, she, she does everything with so much excellence. And at times I wonder, how does she do it all? How is she in a WhatsApp group responding to something that if another, if it were a different CEO, they'd not even be bothered with. And she's still handling such big things. But then I know that she, she also has so much grace, you know, so much grace for, for everybody. But if I, I, I wonder how she does all this, but if I were to take or give a good guess is two things. One, I have known her to be such a woman of faith. If you're in Esther's class, you start with prayer. We close with we close we, we close with play, prayer. Sorry, oh, wow. we we close with prayer. And the other thing is something that she mentions over and over again, and I don't think we quite get it. If you're in Lapid, you'd know. She says that you need to dignify every moment with your full self, and that I think that looks like tackling things that are boring with your full self tackling things that you are interesting for you with your full self. And she also mentions that you need to get comfortable with the boring. So obviously if she's tackling everything with her full self, obviously the result is going to be excellent, yeah? But I don't want to talk too much about her. I'll give her the chance to one, introduce herself and who she is and what, what Lapid is to her and what Lapid means to her. And yeah, so Esther, if you're with us, Karibu Sana. Uh, Leslie, maybe before Esther joins us, I could yeah. share a few things. I could help you with a few things to read. I see we have people from different places here. Um, maybe I can read the first few, then you can read the others. I see, for example, that we have Ruth. leaders looking forward to an interesting session. Thank you so much, Ruth Kihoro. We look forward to really hosting you and meeting your expectations. I see Bernadette to everyone saying, good evening, I'm Bernadette Kimati from Machakos. My first time joining your webinar, looking forward to learning more. Uh, Karibu Sana Bernadette. I see Marcy Chepkoet, student listening from Kerry. Thank you so much, Marcy. I see Magdalene Jambi, previously a Lapida, listening from Nairobi. Hey, Magdalene, it's so good to see you. I see Debbie. Good evening, everyone. My name is Debbie Sialo, joining from Rongai. I got to know about this on LinkedIn. This is my first webinar. I've never heard of Lapid until today. Mm. I'm an entrepreneur and I joined this because I want to learn how my business can grow and become successful. Then I see that we have Charity Mutua, student from UN, joining us. I also see that we have Francis Kihato. Um, he's a Lapida taking lead self pillar, listening in from Kakamega. And then I see also a notice from our colleague Frank saying that there's only one day left to apply to the Lapid experience. Please don't miss out to this amazing opportunity. And he has shared the link there. Um, then I see Maureen Wangeshi. <laughs> hey, Leslie, please help me. We have so many people and we just want to appreciate all of you guys before we uh, get started with today's guest. Um, I see Maureen Wangeshi to everyone. I'm Maureen Wangeshi listening uh, from Mombasa, my first time on a webinar with Lapid leaders. Karibu sana. Um, Maureen Wangeshi, we hope to meet your expectations. Um, then I see the question from Masi. Masi, we have the interviews tomorrow, so don't you worry. Then I see Nancy Owino, that's actually a former classmate. Nancy Owino, listening from Garden Estate area, was invited by my friend, Rufa. Yes, Karibu Sana uh, Nessi. Um, then I see I'm Brian Periot, I'm a Lapida listening in from Gedurai. Karibu Sana Brian. Then I see Good Evening from Rose Mwangi. My name is Rose Mwangi. I'm listening in from Nairobi. 
this is my first time in council with Lapid. I wish to learn more about you and wish to join the team too. I am an accountant by profession, also seeking employment. Um, then I see, I see another friend of mine, Kanye, listening from Britain, is invited by Rifa. It's really good to see you, Kanye. Karibu sana. Then I see Aska Terono listening from Yeri, my second time encounter. That's really, really good. I see from Sharon, oh, Sharon Christine, previously a Lapida listening in from Nairobi. Always delighted to hear from Esther and learn from her. That's amazing. And I think that's just part of the chat that we have today. I see from Janet Muturi. Good evening. I'm Janet Muturi listening in from Wayakiwe via Zoom, second time encounter. It's really good to have all of you guys present here. If you're yet to introduce yourself, please do so. We would really like to see where you're tuning in from. So please tell us your name, where you're doing this call from. And if you don't mind, you can share some of your expectations that you have with us this evening. Leslie, Leslie maybe I, could, I can ask you before Esther joins us. What is, yeah, one sure. thing you're, what is one thing you're looking forward to hearing even as you host this session today? Mm, that's such an interesting question. And before I respond to that, I think mm -hmm. I'd like to one uh, appreciate the conversation going on on the chat box. Thank you so much, guys, for your engagement. If you have any questions, don't be left behind. I, I see a concern of why we are closing the, the application by tomorrow. You still mm -hmm. have between today and tomorrow. And all you need is to, one, share your details on the chat box, and then somebody will reach out to you and help mm -hmm. you out. So no panicking. If you have any question, any sort of question, there is no small question. Just be sure to, to ask on the chat box. Uh, mm. What am I looking forward to? Oh, that's a very interesting conversation. And I like the topic that we are focusing on entrepreneurship among the young people. And us being young people, it, it not yet means that we can start one, uh, start out entrepreneurship. You know, at times, this, this uh, notion that goes around that entrepreneurship is for the people who want gone through employment and we see that a lot and there's like a positive side of that where you go through employment you learn from your employer you learn what the expectations of the marketplace and what the environment in the marketplace looks like before you decide and also even work ethics things like that before you decide to 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 venture into entrepreneurship but then this conversation is around entrepreneurship by young, among young people so i'm interested to hear how how as a young person do I start out with what, maybe no experience or maybe no capital or maybe I do not even have there's no entrepreneurship in our family maybe everybody in our family is in the corporate world then how can I start out and then what are some of the challenges because it's always a good thing to learn from people who've gone ahead of us and like I'd mentioned Esther has more than 10 years experience in entrepreneurship yeah so obviously she knows some of the things that might help us she knows the do's and, and don'ts of the entrepreneurship world so it, it will be very interesting to learn from somebody who is very experienced and who is would be generous. As I know her, she's very generous with information. So I'm very looking for I'm looking forward to the conversation. I I hear you and I also look forward. Actually, one of the things I want to learn is, you know, with the way you read a lot of figures. For example, I was actually reading the standard newspaper and there's this, I think an article from last year that was saying there's about 40,000, yeah, 40,000 SMEs are dying every year. And you know, you'll find them, they're saying that 25% of startups in Kenya uh, fail within the first, the first year, then 30% fail within the second year. And half of them fail by the time you're finishing, like by the time five years are ending. So I'm very curious, like why I should go into entrepreneurship when there have been such high chances, um, when there are such high chances of failing. But also I'm curious to know maybe perhaps what, uh, what our guest today has to share about that rate of failure. Is it influenced by the way, by what people do, or is it influenced by... I don't know, like, is there, are there things that we do not know that if we knew it would change the way we run our businesses, for example? So I'm very, very curious to hear what our guest uh, is going to share tonight. 
And maybe you can allow me, uh, Leslie, to, share, to read a few more chats from people that have joined us this evening. Um, yes, sure. I think Janet, yeah, okay. So I see that Janet Moturi, I think Janet, I had already read you. Thank you so much for being here. She's from Moyakiwe. I see Michelle Dewa, she's listening or he is listening from Nairobi. I'll just say they are listening from Nairobi. Then I see uh, Frida Moragua from Kerry listening from Nairobi. And you know, if you haven't introduced yourself as yet, we are very curious to hear where you're doing this call from and perhaps one thing that you look forward to hearing by the end of this session. Um, maybe, Leslie, I could do another um, question for you as our guest judge joins us. Uh, have you ever started a business? <laughs> uh, uh first thing that came to mind is i don't know if that is, i don't think it's a business for sure mm. but like i think i've been i've carried the entrepreneurial spirit ever since ever since mm. the old days so when i was in high school mm. i remember we'd we used to sell you know how 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 you can sell we used to sell pin pops in high school so it was one illegal so I don't mm -hmm. think that was the best way or, of approaching uh, entrepreneurship. But then mm -hmm. I identified myself as, I identified as an, an entrepreneur. So mm -hmm. we'd won, we used to have such big margins, such big markups. Like we'd get a pin pop for 10 shillings and then you're selling it at 50 shillings. So I, I, I tend to think that I have always had the entrepreneurial spirit, but I have I started a, an inter, a, a business really? I, mm. I haven't. Maybe the one thing that I, I, I've tried to do is more a social enterprise or something to give back to the society. I don't know if maybe Esther can explain or yeah, maybe she can explain if that too is termed as a business. If we are not there for the profit, is that mm. then a business? If it's an, a non-profit, is it a business? Mm. I know the underlying principles would apply, but then what makes a business a business? Mm. Okay, so then in that case, yeah, over to you, Leslie. I see that our guest judge for today is here. I'm very curious to hear uh, what Esther's take is on whether a nonprofit is a business as well. All right, over to you. Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rispa. Thank you for taking that up. And thank you so much, guys, for the engagement on the chat box. Let's, let's continue. Continue. Let's keep engaging on the chat box. Uh, and thank you so much. I see Esther has finally joined us. Uh, I feel sad that you are not there to see me introduce you. I had a whole, I had a long list of the things that you have learned from you. But it's fine. You can go back to the video and see. <laughs> so hi, Esther. Please go again. Assume I, you're starting. <laughs> No, I, why, I, I know maybe you'd not want me to go over your bio because you already know these things. It's you that have achieved them. But one, I did highlight some of the things that you've done. And I, I mentioned that one, you are the, our amazing CEO and founder for the Lapid Leaders Africa program. And that you're also an accountant. I'm an accountant and you're also an accountant. But I mentioned that um, I'm no match for you. Because when you've worked with the, with the biggest firms that we, if you're an accountant, you know, or an auditor, you know that you'd want to work with them. We worked with PwC for over eight years, and it was just not not just in Kenya; it was also in the UK. And that you also have over ten years' experience in building businesses. Uh, you're also a corporate and SME consultant, working with business owners to help them strategically grow their businesses. Uh, your experience also uh, is, is now recognized at national level. You are recently en engaged in a, involved in a, in, a, in a show, the national show, the national bank show for women in business, or some may have it as you've got business. But that, is, that was not my introduction. That is your bio. What I was telling them about you is, is that I, I admire you greatly, and I have learned so much from you like from the moment that I met you. I knew, obviously, because everybody that comes to Lapid, they know who you are and they have your bio and of the things that you've done in life. But uh, the fact that you've, act, you've been like a mother figure for us, for so many of us, for people who, who had come ahead of us, and now even people who are joining uh, today, they quickly realize that you are a very approachable person. 
you will be tackling very big things, but when I approach you as a person, you will treat me with as much concern. And I always wonder how you're able to do that, how you have so much grace. And I was mentioning, I, I am not sure why, but if I was really were to guess is that one, is because I know you to be a woman of faith. And I've learned so much just from observation on how when we get into a class, like the first thing that we do is say a prayer. And when we close, we pray. And the other thing is something that you keep mentioning every now and then. And I felt that we don't quite take it, quite, we take it lightly. We say that you need to dignify every moment with your full self. So if that looks like having your camera on, if that looks like sitting down with the boring and being comfortable with the boring. So if I was thinking about it and I thought, if that is how you handle your task, it, not everything has to be interesting for you to, to dignify it with your full, your full self. And that is you. You go through the roughs and things that are interesting to you and you treat them with the same, like as, as the same importance, which is, is very admirable. So yeah, those two things. And we thank you. We thank you for being our mother. And uh, yeah, karibu sana. <laughs> thank you. That's a fantastic intro. I love it. Thank you, Leslie, so much for that introduction. I know you have questions. I know you have a plan, but allow me just disrupt you slightly um, briefly, and then I'll hand over back to you. But, um, and I know this is being shown live on LinkedIn, but we will do something radical because we are us. Um, business is spiritual and it's political. Um, and so we will start with all of us taking a few minutes to pray for the country. Um, today, the country has been, in my assessment, in a place that I think is dangerous. Um, I think there are issues behind it. I think we have a cost of living that we need to submit to God. And then we also have a political impasse that we need to submit to God. And so before we talk about business, we live in a country and it's an environment that we must lift and honor. And so I will request us, um, whether you're in LinkedIn or whether you're um, on Zoom, to take a minute to whisper a prayer for the country and then I'll also lead us in a word of prayer. And then we will allow Leslie to lead us the way he, she would have lead us, but it's important for us to start there. And so I'll request that all of us to take a minute wherever you are and whisper a prayer, send a prayer to God over this nation. Um, uh, yes. So a minute for all of us to pray and then I will lead us now out of prayer. Our Father and our God, we honor you and we bless you. I thank you because your word says that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence and that we will find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need, Lord. I thank you because your word says that we can enter the gates with thanksgiving and that we can enter the courts with praise. And so, Lord, we want to thank you for the nation of Kenya. We want to thank you because of the name Kenya, Lord. We want to thank you because of the great things that you do in this nation, Father. Lord, we are a nation that has the hand of God over it, Father. From the birth to now, Lord, we've seen you, God. We've seen you fight for the nation of Kenya. And so, Lord, we enter the gates with thanksgiving for the nation of Kenya. Thank you because it's our motherland, Lord. We don't take it for granted, Father. We praise you because of your dreams for Kenya, Lord. We honor you because you have a good plan over the city and the country of Kenya, Lord. We thank you because it is a lack a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, Lord. God, we submit this nation to you, Father. We bring it to you, the author of this nation. We bring it to you, you God. Your word in Genesis says that you hovered earth and you found a formless dark earth. And Father, you said, let there be light. And there was light. Father, in the name of Jesus, we decree, let there be light in Kenya. Let there be light in Kenya. Let there be light in Northeastern. Let there be light in Rift Valley. 
Let there be light in Western Kenya. Let there be light in Nyanza province. Let there be light in Nairobi province. Let there be light in Kenya in the name of Jesus. We command every darkness that's hovering over this nation to flee. Because when the light enters, the darkness has to flee. And so, Lord, we stand on your word that we arise, Kenya, arise and shine for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. We bring under our feet every work of the enemy in the name of Jesus. We bring under our feet every confusing spirit that's hovering around this nation. We bring under our feet every dismissive and fighting spirit that's hovering under this country, Lord. And we decree and declare, let your kingdom come and let your will be done in this nation as in heaven, Lord. I want to call out a spirit of wisdom upon our leaders. I want to call out a spirit of humility upon our leaders in the name of Jesus. I silence every spirit of pride. I silence every spirit that's elevating itself above your name, Lord. And I ask that, Lord, you release a spirit of humility upon this nation. I ask that you release a spirit of wisdom. That, Lord, our leaders would know how to govern with wisdom, Lord. Father, you are tells us over time, Solomon led with pride. And because of that, he increased the cost of living of his people. And the nation collapsed and it was split into two. In the name of Jesus, I command that spirit of pride to flee from this nation in Jesus' name. Father, there is a sense in which we're in a time of drought. But Lord, your word says through Isaiah, through the book of Genesis, that you blessed Isaac in a season of drought, Lord. And so, Lord, we decree that Jehovah of Jehovah Rehoboth, would you reign in Kenya? Jehovah Rehoboth, would you reign in Kenya? Jehovah Rehoboth, would you reign in Kenya? The Lord, in this season of drought, Father, we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We decree that the cost of living will come down. And the Lord, the prayer that we have as our national anthem will speak for us. Oh, God of all creation, bless this land. Bless this land, Lord. We silence the enemy. We silence pride. We silence every work of the enemy. We decree that let your kingdom come and let your will reign in this nation as in heaven. God, we submit this session to you. The Father, as we have a conversation as entrepreneurs, I call out a spirit of Rehoboth to reign on us, Lord. That Father, what we hit today, Lord, will produce and will produce greatly. We honor you, Lord. I thank you for silencing the enemy. I thank you for taking authority over this nation. I thank you because the borders of this nation belong to you, not to any man, Father but to you alone. So reign, Lord, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you, Christy, for allowing me to disrupt you. Um, we cannot have conversations on entrepreneurship without understanding the context in which we live in. And Kenya is our business. Before any other business, Kenya is our business. Um, there is um, there is a sense of hopelessness that hits people that makes us imagine that we can thrive as business people and ignore politics. There's no business without politics. And so we must take the place of the politics as we are taking the place for the business. To you. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Juan, for praying for us and for praying for our nation. Like you mentioned, even as we talk about business and entrepreneurship, there's no business. <clears throat> there's no business without entrepreneurship. Sorry, without, Sorry, without politics. politics. So a stable, so a stable government, government, stable, stable politics, politics means thriving, thriving businesses. Uh, so I, we had mentioned earlier that our conversation for the day is around reinventing ourselves or reinventing yourself as a young entrepreneur. And I'd mentioned that. If you're interested in entrepreneurship, even entrepreneurship and an entrepreneur already, then this is a conversation for you. And if you have somebody in mind who you think who you think that this conversation will be beneficial to them, kindly share the link to them. Uh, so to you, Esther, thank you and welcome to the conversation. I think one of the things that I know is that you're not just passionate about people development. You thrive in developing processes 
and systems for organizations in Africa, and that will include entrepreneurs. So building systems and structures that support the growth and development of entrepreneurial leaders. So could you kindly highlight us, to, highlight to us what the journey has been, what the journey with business development and molding young entrepreneurs has been so far? Thank you, Leslie. Um, I think that's a fantastic question. I like the way you framed it and I am buying time because I'm thinking through the answer to that question. But let me just perhaps share a bit of my journey and then use that to be able to put context around what my experience has been with business development. I had the, as you mentioned, I'm an accountant um, and that's an important thing to mention, especially for business, because one of the things I have noticed is because we are very creative as a country, we think in terms of ideas. But a business is more than ideas. Business is ideas, but it's also systems, it's also processes. And one of the most important systems and processes for any business is to understand the finance behind it. It does not matter if you have the most phenomenal ideas or the most phenomenal enterprise in your brain. If you do not understand the financial implication of running that business, you cannot run business. And so when I start my background, I think accounting is a big part of it. I process business from that perspective. I ask, what's a financial model? I ask, is that financial model sustainable or is this a good hobby? Because those two are different. Uh, a hobby doesn't need to think about money. A business needs to think about money. And so the accounting background perhaps makes that more elevated. So start, studied as an accountant, um, got the privilege of starting my career with PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is, um, they're called one of the big four audit firms globally. Um, it's a phenomenal place to have started the career and I'm grateful to God for it. Um, and what that did is it gave me an opportunity to interact with very many clients. And so I was doing audit and consulting. And when I think back, I have clients in this country, literally across the country. Um, I was in a space the other day and we'll have a conversation with somebody and then I told them actually that CEO used to be one of the people that I used to audit which is perhaps the privilege of starting an a career in audit I worked with clients from all sectors I've done oil and energy, energy did quite a bit of audit of shell I've done pharmaceutical audits I've done financial services which is my favorite I've done um, emerging businesses I've done your manufacturing space. So I've engaged in business literally in all sectors. Um, my last year within PwC, I had 60 clients. And part of those 60 clients, some of them were in government, some were in private sector. Um, so I've literally engaged with businesses in all sectors. And I thank God for that. I primarily at some point knew that I'm called towards the financial services space. Um, and so I was involved in some of the large mergers within the country um, from an early stage. I was involved in the merger of CFC and Stanbeck. In UK, I was involved in the merger of Legacy Lloyds and Legacy H. Bost, what it's called today, which is Lloyds Banking Group. So I've been involved in the financial services space, and that perhaps is a place that I enjoy the most. So worked with PwC for eight years, um, two years while in UK, and that's how I ended up doing quite a bit of work with Lloyd's Banking Group, um, and then came back, did one more year in the end, stepped out, um, ended up in a banking space, and banking also gave me another space around the enterprise, and I was in risk management, and what risk management does is... It starts with the job of asking when you give us a loan, does that loan make sense for the bank? Because the bank is in the business of protecting deposits. So when Leslie gives a bank deposits, the bank has a responsibility to make sure that they will give you back your deposits when you need them. But in the meantime, what they do is they convert that to loans. And so the risk management is about what are the processes that we have to make sure that Leslie's deposits are safe and that therefore we are giving loans to the right people. And so did that for about two years, um, which was a great experience. I again interacted with businesses from all kinds of sectors. Um, this was a smaller bank, which perhaps gave me more access to the SME. I think this country is primarily micro, but that was more in the SME space. 
Um, and then in 2014, left employment, formal employment, and started Lapid. The last eight years, I've seen very many businesses come from Lapid. I consider them micro businesses. And so perhaps that's sort of the background that I have in terms of enterprises. I've seen large enterprises locally and globally. I've seen large enterprises at SME level. I've seen large enterprises at micro level, which is perhaps the reason why I consider myself able to advise enterprises with ease um, is the long answer to your question. Thank you. Thanks for the response. That so means if I have an idea, that is not enough. Ideas are not enough. And I hope you saw how I roll my eyes. Yes, they are not. <laughs> okay, understood. And also the other thing that I've gotten from your point is that you're the person to approach if I am micro, a small, a tiny business and I want to grow into this mega business, you are the person to talk to. Yeah, actually, that's one of my bigger passions. I mean, when I left um, the bank, I was clear I was going to run Lapid, but I also have clarity that for this continent to grow, we have to grow the micro and small enterprises. Um, I'm doing an article around this. And I started with this mega vision of helping micro businesses, small businesses to be able to figure out systems and processes. I think somewhere along the way, I gave up on that dream because I think the business space in Kenya is extremely difficult and it's more difficult for businesses in the micro and small enterprise space and when you think about systems and structures, it's a nice story. It's harder for micro and small enterprises. So before I joined and started Lapid, I had the fallacy of sort of how easy it is to build those systems and processes. I don't anymore. Um, and so in fact, I'm in a stage in my life where I'm debating with whether even they are helpable. And I know that's a hard conversation to have, but I do think they are, but I do see the headache behind building businesses. It's not a romantic process. Oh, okay. Interesting. Uh, I don't know if you want to get into the conversation of why it's hard, but I, yeah. I, I'd i like, sorry? I can go into it. Yeah. Um, yeah there are many reasons. Uh, there are very many reasons I will give you four. Okay. Um, the first reason is what we started this session with. We have a philosophy that says, if you don't have employment, go and start a hustle or a business. Um, I think that's a lazy way of dealing with the actual problem of unemployment. Um, I think we have a philosophical problem around how we set up enterprises. If you look at France and you look at Uganda, France had a history of, at some point they had the highest entrepreneurial, were well, the most entrepreneurial country in the world many years ago. Right now, the most entrepreneurial country in the world is actually Uganda. But at the center of that is unemployment. And you have high levels of youth, high, low levels of employment, which then converts into entrepreneurship, which is fine. But you have to be able to ask what systems processes did France, as an example, put in place to enable enterprises to grow. Enterprises don't grow because we inspire everybody to be an entrepreneur. Enterprises don't grow because we tell everybody to become a hustler. That's not enough. Um, there is an environment that enables enterprises to grow. And so the first difficulty we have for enterprises in this country is we will have a lot of hustlers. We will not have business that can be able to employ people, that can be able to sustain people. And so we have to have hard conversations around what kind of environment enable enterprises to grow? What kind of costs? I mean, when you think about in the recent past, you have debates about China Square. And at the heart of that conversation is what has China done that has enabled the enterprises to be able to produce cheaply and import here and sell at a cheaper price than the guy in Kariobangi uh, or the guy in you know, the other places around here that we were fighting for. And that's around government policies. And there are no shortcuts. Enterprises grow because of government policies. And so we have to do the hard work of asking what are the government policies and how are they enabling enterprises to grow in this nation is the first challenge. The second challenge is the three that are bundled together, which is capital, skills, and market. 
So if you want to grow a business, you need access to not just capital, you need access to patient capital. And there's a difference between those two. Capital is capital. Patient capital is patient capital. But the reason patient capital matters is it allows businesses to survive for long as they figure out the business model. So if you think about a lot of the businesses that, are, that do well today, and especially in the Kenyan context, I will be very honest, not all, but a good number, you will find somebody financed that business. And that can be you come from a family where they have the capacity to give you the patient capital or you have done employment and therefore you've raised the patient capital or you have done, um, there's, a, there's a story of patient capital. And that's where governments should play the most, if you ask me. When you think about the youth fund, the idea behind the youth fund is to provide the youth patient capital. And so if we are not giving businesses patient capital, we are setting them up for failure. So that's the second challenge. Government policy number one, number two, capital. Number three is markets. If I give you capital and I don't help you to think about the markets for your product, assuming you're selling, um, I want to give shout outs to Lapidas, assuming you're uh, like Martin Mwimbi who sells aquariums and you guys should go to instagram and please follow his page somebody put it up in the chat room he runs an organization called aqua century fantastic business um that provides aquariums if you're not providing him with markets and enabling him to think about what's the market for this aqua century what's the market for these aquarium products then that business cannot grow and so at the heart of business is markets um, and that's why, if you remember a while back, the government created this, this idea of let's ensure that the 30% of government tenders are given to young people. I think something like that. What they were trying to do was create markets. So policies, government policies, capital, markets. And then the last one is skills. It, it, business is, there's a skill behind it. And so people need the business skills and they need management skills. If you don't have those two, you cannot grow a business. Um, though we keep talking about that this country is not raising uh, from university students who have the skills that employment needs. So we talk about half big graduates. And we talk about how a lot of entrepreneur businesses today struggle with getting the right talent for people to work with them. Now, we then tell people to go and become entrepreneurs. There is something about that that doesn't make sense. Deal with the issue in between, which is skills. And so you have to do the work of the government policy. You have to do the work of markets. You have to do the work of capital. You have to do the work of skills for businesses to grow at large scale. Now, that is from a big picture perspective. And I'm coming back to you, Leslie, because clearly I've taken over your question. That's the same answer that applies to a small business. If you're thinking about business, your big challenges lie within those questions. How do I engage with politics? You do not have the luxury of deciding whether you will elect, you will go for campaign and go for elections or not. You don't. Your business depends on your government, your government perceptions. Number two, where am I getting my patient capital? You must have that conversation upfront. Don't just sit and imagine that. I will grow the business because I have been inspired by Esther. It is a lie. You must figure out where the patient capital will come from. And then you must ask, what does it look like for me to build markets? And so what partnerships? And the beauty of markets today is with a digital space, you're able to think about markets more easily than you did before. And then lastly, what does it look like for me to build the skills to grow my business? Nima Kujibu. Yes, uh that's very interesting because I'm thinking as a young person, um, I'm fresh from campus, yeah? And, and maybe I do not have the skills. Like I was saying, you even need managerial skills. And by the time I have access to such skills, maybe it's five years into the marketplace for me to understand what even management means. So what do, and I, I, do, not, I, do, not, I do not have the privilege of patient capital. So what do I do in the, meantime before it gets to that place where I'm like okay well now I think we can start a business or we can execute this idea that we had 
those are good questions. I'm a radical person. I give people radical truths. That doesn't work for everybody, but it is the way I exist. So I don't sugarcoat things. Now, when I say that, I normally go, I, I'm about to say very hard truths. So what does a university person do with that truth? There are many things you can do. Let me actually not make this very hard. But number one, I will be very honest. If you can get a bit employment, be employed. Long and short. If you can get a job, please go and be employed. What that does is it enables you to build the capital. It enables you to build the networks that then become your market. And then it enables you to build the skills. So please get yourself a job. I am cognizant of the fact that there are no jobs in this market or there are limited jobs. The level of unemployment is at 40%, thereabouts. Um, I think it has been at 20%, but if you look at post-COVID, when we will be honest with our numbers, we'll be headed towards 40%. So what do you do if you can get a job? One, that's the, also the value of mentorship and that the, the a bit of story, though I'm currently part of the You've Got Business a show. And one of the things that I want us all to go do, um, and Leslie, you will lead us through this, is I'd like us all to go to the National Bank YouTube channel and follow it because we will be releasing content every week for businesses. Um, but one of the people who is in the show um, did their presentation. And then I told them, whatever you're running is not a business. It needs work. And I told them as a minimum, they must go and figure out the financial model. And we had a launch a couple of weeks ago for the show and they came and looked for me and told me, Esther, you made me not sleep for three days. I told her that's a good thing. It means I did my job. Um, I don't believe in just inspiring without giving people the tools they need to do the work. And so she told me she didn't sleep for three days because all she was trying to do is figure out the financial model for her organization. And she gave me what she came up with. I told her, good job. And then I sat with her and we we're gonna to continue to have some conversations around it. And then um, I told her one more thing. I told her, I have a new work for you. Go and do XXX. I wanted her to figure out her brand story. And then she said, now you've given me another three days of not sleep. I told her, yes. Do you want to do business or not? She's done this business for the last 10 plus years, but she's not sat. And she told me, Esther, I've been running this thing, but no one has ever asked me these hard questions. And that is the power of mentorship. What mentorship does is it allows you to elevate your way of thinking. And so while you thought you were a star and all those nice things, you most likely are. But in addition to being a star, there's an opportunity for you to grow your business. And so that's what we do when we think about what Lapid exists to do. We exist to ask the young person, who you are advocating for, um, Leslie, what skills do you need? What mindset do you need to be able to be a successful leader and a successful entrepreneur? Um, and so attend LAPID or find another mentorship program that will upscale your skills in short. Um, and then one more story, there's a guy who he was in LAPID a while back and he was actually running one of the sessions recently and he'd just come back from Germany um, and he went to Germany for a week with, I think it's called GIZ. Um, and so I was just having a conversation with him and he was talking about for him, he would never land in a market like Germany without the challenges that he, or rather the training that he got in Lapid. Because what we then did is we exposed him to mentors who've continued to expand his way of thinking. And because of that, his, while his business still has a long way to go, they've got an awards. Please go and follow them. She are Africa as well. They're doing some fantastic job. Arispa, please put them up in the chat room. And they started with, we have this thing within Lapid where we send students to a country within the region. And so they went to Uganda. Their cohort was going to Uganda. And they met these women who were producing shea butter but didn't have a market for it. And so what they did is they formed a partnership where they ordered the, um, the products from um from Uganda, and then they've created products that they sell today, hair products, skin products. And in fact, they've also grown another business that I want all of us to go and follow. And it is called, somebody will remind me, how can I forget, Grace Usenge's business. Um, Rispa can check. Um, she's called Grace Usenge. She's currently in Rwanda and expanding her business. She's going through a different fellowship called Jasiri. Um, but she literally started that business 
through the Africa experience that they went to Uganda. Why am I sharing those things? In addition to the fact that you all need to sign up to LAPID, but the bigger picture for me is LAPID really is just that it's an organization. But the bigger picture is for a young person, you if you intend to start a business, you must figure out how do I get the mentorship that builds my, men, my skills, my business skills, and my leadership skills. Um, the patient capital is a job. But part of the reason why we are partnering with National Bank is they have phenomenal products for entrepreneurs. And so if you have this idea, then you're able to access such organizations that are able to give you capital that grows your business. There's a program we run called Crossroads that work. I promise this is the last story and then I come back to you. But works with people who have more experience. And for example, this week I was spending quite a bit of time with some who have actually been running business from 2019 and their business is actually doing well. And I think that's important for me to highlight. It's very easy for us to imagine that it's all gloom. Actually, no. It's to say that there's a lot more possibilities. I mean, I meet phenomenal entrepreneurs who are hustling and building businesses from ground zero, but it's that they can be elevated. And so this guy signed up for Crossroads because he wants to build his leadership and management skills. And so he... And he's doing, building a fantastic business. But one of the conversations that we had is around what does it look like for him to um, build the entrepreneurial skills of structuring the business? So he's grown a business, yes, from ground zero, but he's not thought in terms of systems, processes. And so that's a conversation that I'm helping him think through so that then he's able to scale up this business. I... Take what I have said too much. No, thank you. Thank you a lot. I think we're actually addressing a lot of the questions that I have I had for you. So do not apologize. Let's go on and on and on. It's okay. Uh, I'm actually saying the next question that I had is why is it important for us to talk about entrepreneurship among young people in Africa and in Kenya one and Africa generally? Hmm, that's a good question. I will tell you what my answer is, and then there's also the paper answer. <laughs> Which one do you want first? You answer, please. <laughs> I think the paper answer would have been a better one to go with because it's easier. Um, trying to figure out the name for Grace Usenge's business, Ayana. Can we go and follow Ayana? Um, let's support our fellow young people as they run the businesses that they are running. Um, and I will keep sharing others because it's important for us to be able to support um, the business. So I've shared Aquacentury, Shia Africa, and Ayana and National Bank. And those four, let's put up their links. Let's go and follow them because it's important for us to also do the part that's ours. There is no one who is coming to save us. So we might as well figure out what is our part. How do we do the work for the part that's ours? Um, you asked me a question and then I've forgotten. What was the question? <laughs> uh, what we wanted to find out is why is it important for us to talk about entrepreneurship among mm -hmm. the young people in, in both Kenya and Africa generally? Okay. My answer and then the right book, the book answer, which is both I bag it. Mm, the, for me, the reason I'm bought by enterprises is because of many reasons. One is when I think about LAPID and our mission within LAPID, our goal is to ask, what does it look like for us to reimagine the possible in Africa? Really, that's the bigger picture for us. Um, we ask the question of, we have a beautiful content. So part of what I mentioned was I worked in UK at some point and every three months I would come back home. Um, I was in New York the whole of last year, but I was very clear that this is home. And what makes this home is not just that I'm born Kenyan, it's that I actually believe in the potential of Africa to solve the problems of the world. Now, many of us think about Africa as a recipient, begging, asking for help. I don't. I think of Africa as a solution to the world, that when Africa rises, what we will be able to do is put more humanistic solutions within the continent, within the world. So the current civilization was built around industrial age that was built around capitalism. I personally don't believe that that by itself works. 
what works is a humanistic kind of capitalism if there's such a thing and i think africans at their heart are exactly that and so when i think about africa rising i don't think about africa rising as oh we were saved and we rose no i think about africa rising because we can and must and being able to rescue the world from the self-destruction that it has now the reason i say that is the path to that is entrepreneurship at the heart of entrepreneurship in my mind is an opportunity to solve the problems that this continent faces. It's to be able to say, let me give you two practical examples. Um, and I think one of them, I'm not sure if they're still working, but let me just give you the way that I know of them. So one of our alumni, um, we have a partnership with an organization in Ghana um, called MEST, Multi Water Entrepreneurial School of Technology. And they pick up the people within LAPID who are entrepreneurial and have high capacity and they have a competitive process, but the partnership allows them to be able to go through the process with more ease. And so they picked up, they picked up a first cohort and then there was a second cohort. And one of the people who they picked up was um they they put together a solution that uses blockchain to enable to Mamamboga to have access to cheap products. So um, technology can sound complicated. Me, I like to simplify it. If you think about Mamamboga, they buy nyanya at five bob, another one at five bob because they're buying two nyanyas. But if you aggregate those Mamambogas, you end up with a hundred Mamambogas and so you have economies of scale. And so therefore then they buy those products cheaply. And so that's what that company does. They've built a platform in South Africa for women in Soweto that enables them to aggregate their markets, buy products cheaply. And then that became financial services, etc, etc. Or another one. Um, a lady who she was working in a hospital, again, a lapida, and they started to see a lot of Boda Boda guys would walk in, but they didn't have medical insurance. Build a platform that brings together medical insurance people. I don't know how they use blockchain to do it, but they use blockchain. And as a result, they had a community of thousands of Boda Boda guys who now they could negotiate with for uh, medical insurance medical insurance. And so then they have access to hospitals. Now, I like those two examples they, because they represent the possibilities if young people understand entrepreneurship as a, as a solution. And so we ask, what's the problem? What's the solution? How do we use entrepreneurship to build that solution? And that might sound like it's just big things. When I think about what um, Martin is doing with Aqua Century, at the center of it is still, he is able to solve some problems. I mean, I can't go into too much detail about this, but when I look at the way he runs his business, he's impacting people's lives. And so for me, when I think about entrepreneurship and the reason entrepreneurship must do well is because it's an opportunity for us to sort out the problems that this continent has. The book answer, that is mine. The book answer is, what is the book answer? I'm horrible with book answers, but the book answer is you have high levels of unemployment. Um, and the answer to that is entrepreneurship. Um, the book answer is a lot of economies have been grown because of enterprises. And um, when you think about the history of all the countries I've talked about in the West, at the heart of it is small businesses and enterprises that have built those economies. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I, I I want to listen to you go on and on and on and on, but you have a few more questions. Yes. And also I'm sure our time is almost up. Yeah, we've only tackled very few questions. But it's okay. Yes. Uh I'd like us to talk about Lapid. So a lot of the people who are joining in, whether it's LinkedIn or they got the link, they might not know the story of Lapid. Uh, so I wanted to find out as an entrepreneur and civic innovator, which is a term I learned from Lapid and now use a lot, uh, what motivated you to start Lapid Leaders Africa? Oh, <laughs> good question. Um, the, I actually have already addressed that. Though I was in UK, kept thinking, this country is beautiful, but it's not as beautiful as mine. Um, and I want to be a part of building Africa into what it can be. And so came back, I came back from UK in 2012, um, 2011, actually. Um, and then worked with PwC Steel a bit more, for, then joined the bank. But at the heart of it, I was committed to raise leaders for the continent. I believed that at the gap, one of the bigger gaps um, that we have as a continent is around leaders, 
um, who serve the people. Um, I like to highlight that part because one of the gaps we have today and part of the reason people are on the streets is leadership has been modeled as about self-interest. And so I am I struggle with a lot of the conversations we have because they're about my ego, my interest. Um, and my prayer is that God raises a generation of leaders who can be able to think about life in seventh generations. There's a free principle called seventh generation. And it's Kenyan, it's, I mean, it's African, and it's a lot of indigenous communities. But it talks about that Leslie is a factor of three kind, two kinds of three people. So you're a factor of three people who are ahead of you. So your mom, your parents, your grandparents, and your great-grandparents. There are choices that those three people made that have enabled you to do what you do today. And so Leslie is not self-made. Leslie is a factor of three generations ahead of her. Now that's important for Leslie because it means she then has a responsibility to three generations after her. And that's the seventh generation kind of thinking. Now, the opposite of that is selfish, self-centered thinking that's about ourselves. And if you ask me at the heart of the problems that we face today, Monday, is selfish leadership. And so the reason I started LAPID was to ask, what does it look like for God to use us to raise men and women who are submitted to be about the seventh generations? Um, and that looks like then the process that we take people through in LAPID. We start with lead self. And lead self is about understanding yourself. Because as long as a person doesn't understand themselves, they cannot live beyond themselves. Um, as long as a person does not understand themselves, they cannot live beyond themselves. As long as a person does not understand themselves, they cannot live beyond themselves. And that is the heart of the problem that we have today. If you think about slavery, if you think about colonialism, there's something that one of the forefathers of Africans used to say, that the greatest tragedy of colonialism and slavery is not the fact that we were colonized. It's that they took away our sense of history. And so our history starts with colonization and slavery. That's not our history. Our history is that we are the people who set up the first universities in Timbuktu. Now, if you rob people that history, you rob them their identity. And if you rob people their identity, they will just be going around copying other people's broken systems. And so the, there's an article I'd like for you guys to go and follow, because today we are on a row of helping each other. The, there's an, a phenomenal article that Rispa wrote about um, Ubuntu and the poverty and the trauma of poverty. And I think it was a phenomenal article that I would actually love for all of us to go and read it and it will be shared in the chat room. But the reason I say that is because that's why we do lead self, to help the person understand themselves. But then as part of understanding yourself, you build the values and the mindset that you need to be a change maker. And so we are very big on values. We are very big on mindset. And so we do the work of expanding people's critical thinking, building their self-confidence, building their communication skills, because those are the things that then you move with to lead marketplace. Lead marketplace is about job readiness. And the question that we ask is, what does it look like for you to succeed in a marketplace? The bigger picture for me is not you getting a job, important, but the bigger picture is for you to build the capacity to lead marketplace. And so we have a lady, one of um, our previous presidents in the council, she was elected, she was, she got a job as a general manager and she probably in the other day, somebody else was made a country manager in an organization in Uganda. We recently did a study that showed Lapidas within a year promoted because of those skills. Um, and so the job for us is jobs, yes, but leading marketplace is a bigger picture. So lead self, then lead marketplace, and then, then lead Africa. And lead Africa is a conversation around entrepreneurship. How do we build those solutions that Africa needs? How do we build a Pan-African mindset that is culminates in um, entrepreneurship as well? Some of us, our entrepreneurship should be in businesses long conversation, and then culminates in what we call an Africa experience, which sends students to countries within the region. And they've done Uganda, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Zambia, among others. I say that to say that 
lapid at its heart is to empower young people. I, I personally believe that the greatest asset that the, that the continent has is its youth. But that's a nice terminology if we don't invest in them. And so it, we exist to invest in the youth to be those leaders and change makers. Thank you. And we've all benefited by going through LAPID. So like she said, if you are a young person and you have the need to be empowered, then LAPID is a place to be. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, one, shout out to the people who joined in through the LinkedIn. If you've brought anyone in, kudos to you and thank you. And let's keep the chat active. We might not be able to address all the questions that you have, but if you have any comments, any questions, especially regarding joining LAPID and the application process, kindly put it on the chat box. So allow me to move to the next question. I'd like us to go back to businesses and business development. So the question is from your experience with LAPID, what are the top three, just a moment, what are, the, what are the top three things every young person should consider before starting a business? I feel like we had addressed that when he talks about the skills and the market and the patient capital. So I don't know if you want to mention anything or we can move on to no, the I next can. question. I can, I can always add. <laughs> I think oh, the oh, skills, the, the market and the capital are the foundation that you want to think about. But business is like building a house. And so if you have that foundation thought through, then you want to think about the pillars that will allow the house to stand. What are those pillars? Many, but one of them is thinking through um, your vision, of course. Um, when I work with entrepreneurs, especially within Crossroads, because Crossroads has more experienced people and has entrepreneurs who've run business for a while, one of the things I hear, and it's the gap of skills, because we start business with all the management and the leadership skills, I hear us running business in reactive ways. Um, but there are ways, I think, today you have to have a high level of agility, and so you must be able to adjust a lot. But you, you also need to do the work of building visions. And so the first thing you need to think about is, what is the vision for this business? Tell people about it. They question it. That's an important part of business development. And so one clear vision. Two is brand story. And this is often understated. Um, if you listen to the, and if we have time, Rispa can play that video um, or at least the clip, a bit of the clip. Actually, let's plan to play a bit of the video um, from the National Bank in a short while because I really wanted us to have a five minutes where we all just go to um, the YouTube and follow that that page because we intend to keep doing quite a bit of content there. But the, one of the things I talked about in the first episode is don't do business because you must do business. Do business because you know why you're doing the business. And this sometimes takes time, but that's what a brand story is. A brand story answers the question of why am I in this business? And so let's think about that a bit more. If you think about Dove, 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 um, Dove is a product and they make mafuta, they make hair, but I'd love for somebody to check their vision. Um, I was actually talking about it this past weekend, but their vision has nothing to do with um, mafuta. It has everything to do with your brand story. And so the, the bigger picture of what you want to think through when you're starting is not just the vision. Vision is very important, but you start with a vision. And then after that, you ask, what's the brand story? What will keep me going when this business wants to close me? And often that is quite needs quite a bit of self-awareness. And it's a reason why when within LAPID, we start um, a lot of our sessions with self-awareness. Because if you do the work of self-awareness, then you'll be able to name the the, your brand story with Moise. And so that's the second thing. Vision, brand story. And then the third thing is put together a financial model. The whole idea of you can do business without thinking through um, where the revenue will come from, what the cost of the businesses are, how do you grow each of those things is, is not business. And so at the heart of sort of thinking through um, 
business, I would advocate for those three things. Start with a vision, um, figure out your brand story. I was looking for the brand story for, um, and I'm sure Rispa can access it, but the brand story for, I really like it. I don't know why. Anyway, when you're asking me the next question, I'll, I'll look for it. Vision, brand story, and the financial model. And then there's a lot more after that. I mean, yeah. you need to think about your operational model. You need to think about your HR. How am I staffing this business? You need to think about what is your growth strategy. It's a whole process. Okay. So you don't just get into business. You don't wake up and then you're like, oops, I have an idea. Let's try it out. But it's interesting to hear that your brand story doesn't necessarily have to be aligned with the brand, that you can have a brand like Dove, that, that you have soaps and things like that, but then the brand story is totally different. Absolutely. We actually need to read their brand. Anyway, they recently ran a campaign, which is the one I wanted to read. Let me see if I will see it. I have too many things that I would need to run through. Please recap what you're hearing, and then I will look for it, and I'll tell you when I get it. Okay. I think I'd like to hear from our audience. Uh, let me just mm -hmm. see if I can see. Rispa, do you have any engagement on the chat box? Yes, 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 we do. Okay, please go ahead. Um, yes, uh, as there's actually a question for you, Esther, in the chat from Sylvester. I'm trying to get this question. He was asking, can you expound on the term patient capital? Um, and the context of this question is, like, my second question is, can one practice entrepreneurship as part-time? And finally, uh, if so, what industry can one do part-time without much supervision when starting from a lower level? I think maybe we can look at uh, patient capital first, and then maybe the second question of are there industries where you can start as an entrepreneurship, as an entrepreneur, and it's easier, and are there others that are harder? That is from Sylvester. Uh, so Esther, maybe maybe as we look at that, one last question for you is please expound on why it's difficult to have systems and processes for small enterprises in Kenya. So those are three questions. We'll only actually maybe answer those two for now, then we will be closing. There's a lot we could talk about, but we also wanna observe time. Um so maybe Esther, you can answer the three. One, what is patient capital? Expound further how someone can get access to it. Then secondly, are there industries where it's easier to start a business? And then the, the last question from Nicholas is why is it difficult to have systems and processes for small enterprises? Okay. Um, before I do that, I really want to make sure that we don't lose the opportunity for us to follow the national bank. YouTube page. So I want to give us a minute to go to their page. Somebody can post their link um, mm -hmm. and also share the last episode. And maybe we can just watch, I mean, a short while, um, the first few minutes of that show. We have some branded items from National Bank that are up for grab. And the instructions are if you leave a comment in one of the two episodes that have been uh, aired so far, and your comment has uh, the highest um, likes, then that's the person who is going to win some of the branded items. I think we have some branded, I can't remember what they are. I think we have a branded, some branded, anyway, we have some branded items that are going to be given to the people with comments that have the most people. And so I'd like for us to follow the page, but also I'd like for us to be able to plan to go to watch the episodes, leave a comment, and you will stand a chance to get some of their branded items. They are fantastic branded items that are useful for you all as entrepreneurs, but also we'll be releasing content every Tuesday. Every Tuesday, there's a show that will be released in their, their channel, and you can use those to pick up a lot more information around the businesses that you're running. So I will give us a minute. I don't know if the RISPA has the link been shared in the group. Yes, it has been. Uh, Frank has already shared. If you don't mind, I can share the video with that. We just want the first two minutes that we continue. Yes, please go ahead. 
Okay, our next extracting in active is Nairobi, the green city in Nairobi, the green city in the sun. It's 30 ladies selected from all over Kenya who responded to the call to action. They gather to be briefed on the challenge in a bid to see who survives round one. Four celebrated ladies will judge them by putting these fledgling entrepreneurs through the paces. In the dreaded commerce pitching sessions to the judges, only the very best will survive. This is a show that's all about empowering women. This is a show that is pushing women in commerce forward. This is You've Got Business, powered by NBK. My name is Priska Mandere. I come from Kisi County. I'm a businesswoman dealing with Juakali products. For example, metal boxes, uh, wheelbarrows, uh, spades, shovels, and small home items like jikos. When you go to boarding school uh, or high school, for us who used to go with uh, metal boxes, who couldn't afford the luxurious uh, suitcases from the supermarket, uh, we used to be bought for these metal boxes. They used to be a signature color, blue. <laughs> and then they written your name. So that when you go in uh, form one or in boarding school, uh, no one touches it, you lock it with a padlock. So with the metal boxes, uh, it happened now because everyone was buying it. In, it was a requirement in school. Uh, even the underprivileged or privileged uh, kids could have them. Now it became fashionable. I'm Lynn Odiwa. I come from Migori County. I'm an agripreneur. Women play a very significant role in agriculture. And in Kenya, women from low resource settings uh, engage in indigenous farming of vegetables. My name is Viola Mokoro. I live in Nairobi. I live with my family. I have two daughters and I'm married. I run a daycare center. I'm also the owner of Kumontena Study Center. I'm excited being here because I've uh, been able to meet networks. We are going to stop sharing there because of the interest of time. My colleague Frank has already shared the link to the first episode now. If you look, if you search for You've Got Business by National Bank, you're going to find it. And as we and as we had already told you guys, that there is merchandise to be won. Uh, with that, I would like to perhaps take it back to my colleague Leslie. Um, so that we can come close to the end of this session. Leslie, yes, you may proceed. Thank you. Thanks, Rizka. Uh, one is to share again some of the links that we've been told or the, mm -hmm. some highlights of what we've had. Uh, but before we get to that, let's support the small businesses. Let's support our fellow Lapidas. Even if you're not a Lapida, you are an aspiring Lapida. So let's go to the social media pages of Share Africa. There was Ayana, Aqua Century, and let's read the. I have read the Ubuntu article by Rich, but it was really, it was really good, and uh, and I hope we've all subscribed to the National Bank YouTube channel. So I hope that you all are getting so much from this conversation as I am. So and clearly that this is just the tip of the iceberg. When you join Lapid Leaders Africa, there's so much more. And as you had mentioned, another Esther mentioned, we have a crossroads program. Usually the pillars in the flagship program is the three which you go through, but if you are new into the marketplace or you're in campus or you just left university. But then the platform for the professionals who've done three, five, sorry, five years of experience of work experience, they have another program called Pro Crossroads. It's for professionals who want to make take up maybe take up more responsibilities at the workplace, or they are looking to get into management, or even if you're desiring to get into a different career path. So maybe you've been on a certain path for five years, but you feel it's time to change. There is a program for you which starts in May. So if you're crossroader, kindly also inform us, inform us on the chat box. 
and somebody will reach out to you. Uh, I, I see the time is how much good. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can take two more questions mm -hmm. and then we can wrap it up. Uh, the question that I see that my, Esther might have not, uh, the good thing is that as she talked, she was just addressing a lot of the questions that we had before. So we can use, we can skip to. I think there's a question that um, was asked around what is patient capital. As you look for any other two questions um, that we can close okay. with, I can address those two. Uh, that question, patient capital is patient capital. Um, I know I haven't answered that question, but patient capital is capital that allows you to experiment, capital that allows you to learn and grow your business in a patient manner. So when you think about setting up a shop that sells sugar, as an example, there is a runway period beyond before that business really picks up. That runway period is when you need to do a lot of marketing, runway, that that runway period, you need to figure out what products sell in my shop. That runway period is, it's, you're figuring out your staffing. So you that's that capital enables you to figure out the basics of the business. Now, imagine you don't have patient capital and then you've decided you're selling a shop that has sugar, that has Coca-Cola, the likes. But those products don't make sense in the location that you are in. You end up closing that business and that's the end of you because I want to rent, I want to a way out because you don't have the product, the business has closed and you don't have access to capital. And so patient capital gives you leeway to be able to figure out the business patiently. Um, and sources of patient capital um, can sometimes include financial institutions. Kenya has a problem with financial institutions that if I get into will take me several hours. But it's a reason I like the work that we're doing in National Bank because what they are looking to is building products that serve people in a patient way. So one is financial institutions, two is family and friends, um, three is you can be able to get some funders who can be able to equip you with the initial patient capital. Funders, investors are part of the uh, patient capital. And then four is sometimes yourself. So if you've worked or you come from a place where you actually have some patient capital, then that also helped. But also sometimes you're in an industry which the runway is faster, in which case then you have the patient capital. Um, and then there was a question around, I wanted to read the vision for, for um, Dove. And they say, we have a vision of a world where beauty is a source of confidence, not anxiety. So they don't talk about the products. They talk about what the products do, which is what brand stories are about. We have a vision of, of a world where beauty is a source of confidence, not anxiety. And so because of that, even when they run, um, and then they say our mission is to ensure the next generation grow up and enjoying a positive relationship with the way they look, um, helping girls to raise their self-esteem is their mission. And because of that, when they run adverts, they have people of all ages, young and old. It's not just young people who are in their adverts. They actually have old people with gray hair. They have people of all body sizes because their mission is not necessarily just to sell the product, but it's to sell the product with an impact in mind. And so that's what brand stories are able to do. What, what fields are fast growing fast? You need to reframe that question because the idea of fast is what is going to get you into trouble. The world is about process and your capacity to be able to sit with things for long enough. There's a quote, I'm um, one of the Obama fellows and one of the things that I picked from President Obama and we spent quite a bit of time on the, with them uh, when we were doing the fellowship was hard things are hard. Hard things are hard. And the reason I like that is because there's, a, there's no romantic process of building business. Hard things are hard. And so you want to build the resilience. And part of actually the reason I like Lapid is one of the bigger things Lapid does is we learn resilience. And if you're going to do business in this market, you need to be able to have resilience. And so please reframe that question. Stop looking for your shortcuts. That's how you'll get yourself into big trouble. Once you've reframed that, then ask what are the emerging fields? So anything technology today is going to be able to have a lot more possibilities than your typical place. And so ask, how do you spend more time on technology? And we spend a lot more conversation time on those conversations as part of the class um, would be one of the places I would look at. 
that was the second question. I don't know if there's any other question. Maybe one last question, and then after that we close because I think we have two minutes before the our time is up. Okay. One uh, last. Question. I have uh, two la uh, the last question. I think mm. it being the International Women's Day, sorry, month, still in March. I'd like to ask, why do we still need to push for conversations around women empowerment and women in business? Haven't we empowered the woman now? Yeah, and that's the other a thing uh, is maybe you can talk to somebody who's started a business and failed and they're still fixed on, I want this to work, but they're struggling. What should we say to that person? So let's start with the easier one, which is the person who's failed. Uh, failure is a school fees for life. Mm. Short. Um, though if you get stuck because you failed once you're in trouble i mean life is just one failure after another and so it's just about mindset um and the mindset that you have around failure that you need to do work on um with regard to the women i think there are several things in that and this is a whole conversation that you can have one there's nothing wrong with one gender being empowered um because if one gender is empowered and they are not choosing to say that because you're empowered, the rest of you don't have to be empowered. Um, I think the idea is to say, can we empower women and also women, men be empowered in the process is the conversation that I have in my mind. Um, the second thing that I have in the, my mind is the common statement that when you women, you empower villages. Um, if you look at a lot of women and the things that women build, they tend to be not just for one individual, but a woman. I mean, I remember when we were doing this show and you will see that when it comes through, a lot of those women are building those businesses for their children. It's so that their children have a meal that day. Um, it's so that they get away from um, gender-based violence. And so though, when you empower one woman, you empower a village is still a truth. Um, and a lot of that is is something that ensures then that we need to continue to empower women this is the second reason. But the third reason is the problem of women being overly empowered is a Nairobi problem. And so when you get out of Nairobi, you realize actually women in Kenya still have a long way to go in terms of their empowerment, a long way. Um, I worked in an industry when I started working within the audit place, the number of women partners you had were minimal. I mean, it was two in a team of 20. At manager level, you had three women in a God knows how many team of men. And that was many years ago. I know that those numbers have improved over time. But if you look at banking, if you look at our political space, if you look at many um, sectors, if you get rid of the fallacy that social media and the fallacy that Nairobi, you will find that actually women are still struggling significantly to find a seat at the table. It's now when we are starting to talk about that Rwanda has a majority of women in parliament. Kenya still has a long way to go. If you get your governors one or two, you think, oh my God, that's a big achievement. And so the whole idea of women overly empowered is to be very honest, an elitist problem. In truth, if you go to the ground, women have a long way to go. And so it should be the business of the men and the women to empower the people who are least empowered. And in this case, if they are the women, we all do the work to make sure that they get more empowered. Um, and that doesn't mean that the contrary is true. We can live with ants. I think the problem is we build a world where people think in ors. It's either men or women. No, it, it's that if women are ukochini, we pull them up very much, but also we continue to work with the men. And so it's the contradictions that we need to be able to sit with. Thank you. That's such a beautiful response. I especially like when you say we don't have to think in ors. That empowering one gender doesn't necessarily mean that you're suppressing the other. Such so beautifully said. So uh, I'd like us to wrap. We have so many questions on the chat box. Maybe Rispa, you can tell us how we are going to address it. Will we have a, a short session for us to address the questions? Do we have, okay, ahead of the next webinar, how will we mm -hmm. address the questions? Because we've unfortunately run out of time. Uh, first and foremost, we have taken note of all the questions that have been asked today. I said there's still so many more 
literally maybe the only one we can answer is because this is just a name. So there's a person by the name Nathan Esther who has asked you for uh, maybe a book or an article or video that you've interacted with that impacted how you view entrepreneurship the most that could help young entrepreneurs grow. So maybe when you make your final remarks, you can share that as well. For everyone else that has asked their questions from Sylvester to Nicholas to Nathan, thank you so much for all of your questions. If you have questions on LinkedIn as well, the most we can promise is that maybe we can compile those questions and perhaps uh, maybe collect the answers from our CEO, then we can write it as an article. So what we are basically saying is that you can get so much more of this if you are join our programs. But also we have our next um, webinar in this series that will be coming up on the 27th of April, basically the last Monday of April. We're going to have another one like this. So keep posting your questions. You can even go to our LinkedIn page Ask the questions that we shall find a way to answer every one of you. But I very thank you so much. So Esther, I guess over to you. And lastly, you can share maybe a book that someone can read on entrepreneurship as we close. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I'm a reader, and so I read quite a bit. Um, and I could name like a hundred books that are useful. Um but I think the one that last that deposit that I'm thinking about is two one go and read God's word. The Bible is an entrepreneurship book. Um, there's a time I was doing articles around Moses the entrepreneur. I do hope that at some point I'm able to convert those into books. But the Bible is such a, a book of entrepreneurship. I'm currently doing a study of a Nehemiah and the process that Nehemiah goes through to rebuild the walls of um, um, the Israelites. And that's a process of building. And that process of building is a process that enterprises need to go through. So the Bible is a place to start. The second one that I love is Build to Last, which is a fantastic book um, that talks about what it looks like to build enterprises that last. Um, one of the bigger things they talk about that I believe in is build purpose-driven institutions, which goes back to what we talked about, about the, the brand story. So Build to Last is a fantastic book that I would advocate for people to read. Um, last one that I'm currently chewing on a lot on is called Conscious Capitalism. Um, it's written by the CEO of Whole Foods, which is a humongous organization in the US, but he's converting capitalist conversations into conscious capitalist conversations. Um, and we're spending quite a bit of time on that when we're going through crossroads as well um and a lot more um i think many people think of business in isolation business is actually there's somebody who says business is management and so your leadership capacity your leadership skills your management skills determine the extent to which you're able to build your business is just the way it is but go and start with us I want to end there and then because after this, I will let Leslie to close this with RISPA. Thank you so much, everybody, for um, taking the time to join this session. Thank you for engaging with us. Um, I pray that as you're building your enterprises, that you do work of building lasting institutions. Um, you're welcome to join us in LAPID and join the movement of other young people who are committed to build enterprises that will change uh, the continent by starting to change uh, and transform self. Um, we have a crossroads kicking off in May. We have a current intake going on. Um, so there's quite a bit that you can always engage with within LAPID. We have blogs that we release. Our LinkedIn pages are rich with content. Our Instagram, Facebook pages are rich with content. Our YouTube is rich with content. So please interact with us. Um, there's quite a bit that you can be able to keep picking up along the way. Thank you so much, uh, Leslie, for the question, um, uh, for hosting us. We appreciate it. You did a fantastic job. Well done. I hope we will all celebrate Leslie for representing you. Um, Leslie, this is the first time and first of a hundred many others that she will be hosting with me. Thank you so much for taking this up. I celebrate you for stepping into that space. I can't wait to see what God does through you. A big thank you to Rispa and Frank, who did a lot of the work behind the scenes to get this a session going, um, RISPA birthed this re-imagine, are they called? Re Rebirth yeah. webinars. And at the end of every month, we have a webinar. Um, last month, we hosted Kerry from Hope FM. The month before I did the session, um, and I think 
we have fantastic guests coming up in the coming months. And so thank you, Rispa, for holding Fote in this space. And thank you, Frank, for setting this up and for running the behind the scenes. And anybody else who's been involved in this, there's a whole team that enables us to be able to do this work. So Asante Nisana, please keep us in your prayers. The work of Lapid is a work of faith. It's only God who can build the work that we are doing. So keep us in your prayers, send prayers every time you remember uh, for Lapid, that God will continue to elevate us. And then as you do that, pray for the continent and for the country. Asante Nisana, Rispa, I'm out. I mean, and Leslie, I'm out. Please wrap up for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther. It's always such an honor to feed of your knowledge and vast experience. Thanks a lot. And I think I did hear her say that she's promising to publish us book soon. Aman, I mean, Mr. See pressure, people. But actually, <laughs> I, I need that pressure. I've been publishing this book for a while. Um, okay. But ChatGPT has landed, and hopefully it will help my life. In mm -hmm. I've been it asking God for a, no a platform. Coming. I've actually <laughs> been praying for a system that would help. That's all the mm -hmm. Lord hears our prayers. Now okay. I, have made, I will. I pray I'm able to do it. I mean, I should. Thank will. you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Esther. Mm -hmm. And to our amazing audience, uh, like Rispa mentioned, that you can share your questions. I know we've not been able to address every question. But mm -hmm. you can share your question, especially on the LinkedIn page. On this webinar, it will be there. So just on the comments, you can just ask the questions and then we can address them in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for referring your friends. Uh, as a parting shot, I think the one thing that I've gotten from Esther's conversation is, is that ideas are not just, sorry, businesses are not just ideas. There's so much that goes into the addition of a business, the systems, the structures. And also she mentioned that it's very important for you to look for a mentor. So to get into mentorship in case you're interested in getting into entrepreneurship. Uh, I'd like to thank you. My final mm -hmm. words is that let, let's meet in the next webinar. We'll have a whole other topic we'll be discussing. We never know what's coming up. So mm -hmm. see you next month. And if you have any questions on the application process, kindly, you can also ask the same question on the LinkedIn page. The next webinar, as Rispa mentioned, will be next month, the 27th of April. I think it's the last Monday of April. I've been your host, Leslie Mwange, and good night from my end. Rispa, do you have anything? Oh, oh. Uh, no, 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 not really. Just thank every single person that has joined us tonight. It's been such a joy hosting you, Nancy and Nessie Owino, and I see, um, you know, and I also see that Shrana was with us. For everyone that has been here, thank you so much. If you're still curious about the books, we will also post them on our social media. So just check out our social media in the coming two to three days. We're going to post the books that Esther has said you should also read. But in the meantime, I'd just like to welcome everyone to please unmute your mic if you're still here. Say your good night. It's been an honor to host you, and we look forward to seeing you in the next webinar in April. Thank you, Tanya, as well. Thank you, Sylvester. And so, with that, I wish all of us good night. Thank you, my sister, Coach. Um, uh, Michelle Devo, um, also, thank you as well. Coach, I see your question, and I'll address you personally now that I have your number. Mercy, Jeff, Jamkota Mona Leo. Okay, so 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 Kahili, but altogether, thank you. I'm going to request my colleague, who's the host for this session, to end the meeting for all of us. Thank you so much, guys, and may God bless you and give you all a wonderful, wonderful week. Night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, every single person.